This video is all about one of the most important things in machine learning, which is overfitting versus underfitting. And I've seen a lot of bad examples online where I can't really understand what is overfitting and underfitting and what is the spectrum in between them. So I came up with this example, which I think is the world's easiest example where you can really see overfitting and underfitting and everything in between. Um, so what is this problem? It is what I call the Hayden ball distance estimation problem. And the way this works is let's pretend that we went to the store and we bought ourselves a nice new cannon. There's our cannon. And the only thing we can do with this cannon is set it up and point it at some angle X. And X is going to be on the X axis here in, in degrees. X is going to be the angle in degrees going between zero and 90 degrees. And then we press a button and the cannonball shoots out. And we are going to measure how far did it go. And then I scope that distance is going to be Y the distance y, which is on the y-axis right here. Y is the distance. Okay. And this is all set up into one Desmos thing that is going to have everything from start to finish. So the link is in the description if you want to follow along on your copy of Desmos um, as I click on the little folders over here and reveal things as we go. So the problem is we have this cannon. We can set it to different angles and press the button and shoot it. And we would like to characterize how far it goes for a given angle. So you imagine if we're going to go into battle, we want to know how far the cannon shoots, which way to set it. And we are data scientists. We are not physicists. So the way we are going to do this is we're going to do a bunch of experiments. We're going to shoot the cannon 30 times and then use these 30 pieces of data to figure out how the cannon works. Okay, so let's do it. Um, so here is my data. I shot the cannon 30 times. So every dot here represents shooting the cannon one time. So for example, this shot is at 58.8. We set the cannon to 58.8 degrees. We shot it and it went 10.01 meters. Um, here's one. We set the cannon to 1.4 degrees and it went negative 3.6 meters. It went backwards. Um, and what is going on here is that when we shoot the cannon, we press the button, we set the angle and, and press the button, there is a lot of random noise. So you could imagine there's some wind that pushes the cannonball further or back towards us. And so there's a lot of noise in what is going on. And the true value of what the cannon is actually doing is this curve in blue. So it has a maximum at 45 degrees. It is a zero at zero degrees and zero at 90 degrees. And there is a lot of random noise tacked onto this. So our observations in black dots here are the true value plus some random noise. And we would like to take the, the data we have, the 30 points we have, and discover this true value curve, this blue curve um, that we see here. One of the beautiful things about Desmos, and one of the reasons I love it so much, is you can visualize a curve by listening to it. Let's listen to this blue curve. Yeah, because it's just fun. So here we go. So you can see this curve goes up for a while, and then it goes down for a while. It's a nice non-linear curve, and that is what we want to get. We want a curve that goes up and down and captures this value of 45 degrees being the furthest. So let's see how we're going to do it. So we have our data points. How are we going to recover this blue curve? What we're going to do is we are going to average some points together. So here is what I've come up with an example for you. I have at 45 degrees. So suppose I want to know how far the cannon shoots when you set it to 45 degrees. I choose a window size. In this case, I chose a window size of size five. And I look at all the data points that are within five degrees of the value I want. So within five degrees of 45 is a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 50. And I look at all the cannonball shots in my data set that are between 40 and 50 degrees. And in this case, there's three of them. There's this one, this one, and this one. Um, and I average those together to get the range. So this one had a range of just under five meters. This one had a range of about seven meters. This one has a range of 13 meters. And I average them all together to get a final estimate, which is this estimate here of around eight meters for how far I think the cannonball will go when I shoot it at 45 degrees. Okay, so I'm averaging points from my data set to figure out my estimates. And the question we're gonna answer in this video is what should be the value of the window size? Is five degrees the right window size or should it be bigger? Should it be 10 degrees? Is that better? Or should it be much bigger? Like should it be like 30 degrees? Or should it be much smaller? Maybe it should only be a couple degrees. Uh, if you make the window so small that you don't have any points, we're just gonna go with the nearest neighbor. This is called the one nearest neighbor um, where we pick the nearest neighbor there. Um, so how big should the window size be to optimize our understanding of the cannonball's profile? How are we going to do this? How are we going to say what this is? Well, one thing you can do is you can look at just one point. And we know the true value uh, for this single point at 45 degrees is 10. 
So you can say, oh, we want the window size. We want it to be close to 10. So how about a window size like that? Oh, that's close to 10. Um, but this is kind of cheating because we want it to be a good estimate everywhere. So what we're going to do is drag the test point around. And you can see that Desmos automatically does the math for us and counts up the points and averages them. And we get, uh, you know, some estimate for every single possible value. So no matter where you look, you get some estimate. And you can plot all those together to get a nice purple curve like this, which is what does the function look like when the window size is some given size? So here the window size is 9.6, all the points that are within about 10 degrees of what you want and averaging them together. So it's a nice, it's a nice looking curve. Um, when you make the window size smaller, let's see what happens. So as you make the window size smaller, let's make let's go really extreme. Let's make three degrees. So now we're averaging all the points that are within three degrees of what we want. So for 45 degrees, we're averaging all the points between 42 and 48 degrees, or we go with the nearest neighbor. So here I think it's averaging two points um, together. Uh, it's averaging this point over there and that point up there. And as you slide it around, you see it's wonky. It's going up and down and up and down and up and down. Let's listen to what this function uh, looks like. This is the function estimate. And remember, we want it to have this up down characteristic. Let's see what, what does this one sound like? So option T and then hear the graph. So we can definitely hear, hear with the sound or see visually, this function is no good. This function is up and down and up and down. It's crazy. This, this doesn't match what we want at all. And what is happening here is we are fitting the data really well. We're going through some of the data points exactly. And other ones, you know, we're, we're chasing the data points by like we're, we're coming all the way down to where the data points are. Um, and we're doing too much of that. So we're, we're sort of chasing the 30 data points we have at the cost of leaving the real curve we wanted it was this blue curve, which is a nice smooth curve. And we're nowhere near that. This is called overfitting. This is overfitting. On the other extreme, if you make the window size too big, if you make it so big, let's make it like, uh, I don't know, 30 degrees or something. If you make it 30 degrees, then you get a nice smooth curve. So we fix some of the problem, but now we have a different problem. Let's uh, listen to what this one sounds like. And, and it's gonna have a totally different sound. So this one is very monotone, right? It's, it's almost a flat function. It's not going up and down very much at all. And it's not capturing, again, what we want, which is that up, down, smooth curve of this blue curve, the true value. It's not capturing that very well. It doesn't have the up and down, it's too flat. And this is called underfitting. So in this situation, by averaging over too wide of an interval, we're sort of not taking into account the details of the individual points enough, and that is leading to this flat curve that doesn't capture what we want. So those are the two extreme types of errors we can make. Underfitting, like this, where it's too flat, and overfitting, where we are have too small of a window and we're chasing down all the individual data points um, and we're going up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, and that is not good either. And in between is the Goldilocks. This is what we want of finding some curve, something like this, that is approximating the real curve that we want. And it goes up and down, just like the one we want. Let's listen to this one. And it should kind of feel more up, downy. So. So you'll, you'll hear it went up and down and actually Desmos, every time there's an intersection between the two graphs, it plays a little bubble sound. And so we have a lot of intersections here because we're kind of crossing above and below the graph. So this is better. And we want to have a theory of understanding this overfitting the underfitting thing and explaining why is there a Goldilocks? Why, why can't I just pick one direction or the other? And this is something that comes up a lot in, in many machine learning models. If you can understand it in this simple example, it will help you understand um, those more complicated models. So let's see what's going on. So to start with, I'm going to close out this test point. I want to put on the slider. So here it just tells me the window size and I have a little slider that I can slide it. And for every value of the window size, we can visualize the error between the purple function we estimate and the true blue function. And that's this little error visualization. So here, here is the error visualized for you. When the blue function, the true value is above what we estimate, I'm going to shade that in red. And when we, the purple function is above the blue function, we shade that in orange. And so these shaded areas are representing the errors we're making. And so here we can see when we have a very flat function, we have these big chunky areas of orange and red error. And on the other side, you know, when we're making the other type of error, when we're overfitting and chasing down the points, then we're going up, down, up, down. We have lots of thin areas that add up. 
And in either situation, we can sort of do the average of all these areas and come up with a number that represents the total error, the total error that we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write something called the mean squared error, the mean squared error, and it's going to have two parts. Um, it's going to be made by taking the error at any point. So we, we take the error, which is the difference between the true value on that blue curve and this value, and we are going to square it up. So it's the error squared, the error squared. So for example, in this situation, the true value is around 10. We are estimating around four. Our error here is six. So the error squared in this example is 36. So we get 36 error at this X value, and we're going to average over all the possible X values. So the, the E stands for error, S stands for squared, and M stands for a mean. We're going to average over all X values. Average over all X values. So averaging over this error here and here and here and averaging it over all the points, um, we get something called the mean squared error. Now the mean squared error would have units of the thing squared. So for example, here we would say it's 36 and that is kind of hard to interpret. So it has units of meters squared in this problem. So more common people look at what is called the root mean squared error. So this is, this is the root mean squared error here at the bottom of the screen. We just take the square root of the average at the end so we can interpret it in terms of meters. So this is 3.81 meters. And that means sort of typically we are off by 3.8 meters. The typical distance between the blue curve, the true value, and what we're estimating is typically on the order of 3.8 meters if you average over all the X values. And now we really have this quantitative measure, the mean squared error or the root mean squared error that tells us what is better and what is worse. And let's see what happens as we slide. Now we can slide the window all the way starting with this really tiny window of only two degrees. We can slide, slide, slide and see how it's changing. So when the window was only two degrees, we had up, down, up, down, up, down, and the root mean squared error was like 3.8. And then as the window gets bigger, the root mean squared error goes down. So by the time we get to a window size of 10 degrees, the root mean squared error is only 1.5, which is very good, 1.47. So this curve you can visually see is doing a much better job of capturing the true value than um, the really small window. Uh, and you can see that quantitatively now. Okay, and it, it keeps shrinking for a bit, but then it reaches a minimum and it starts to go up again. So as we increase the window size even more, the root mean squared error, this number right here on the screen, uh, that is increasing some more, going up, 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 until you know you you have almost a flat line, and then you you have again a root mean squared error of like 3.4. So you can see that the best spot quantitatively is this Goldilocks in between thing. Not only does the shape kind of match what we want, but it's minimizing the difference between our curve, our estimated curve, and the true value that we wanted. Okay, so that's the, the quantitative description of what's going on here. And it turns out you can really understand this by subdividing the mean squared error into two separate parts. And so this is, I think, the crux of understanding overfitting versus underfitting mathematically. What does it mean mathematically? We're gonna write the mean squared error, the MSE, the mean squared error is going to be a sum of two different things. There's a bias, blue for bias, and you add up the bias squared plus something called the variance, the variance. So the mean squared error is written as a sum of two different things, the bias squared plus the variance. And when you really overfit, and we'll see this in a second, when you really overfit, one of these terms is high and the other is low. And when you really underfit, the other term is high and the first term is low. And getting the sweet spot in between is having a nice balance of bias and variance. You, you're neither really biased nor have high variance. You have a nice balance of these two terms and that is what minimizes the mean squared error. So to see what this is, to see what this bias means, what does variance mean, what does bias mean? I think the easiest way to visualize it is to imagine what would happen if you had a whole new data set. And fortunately in Desmos, this is very nice to do. So let me um, change a couple settings here and show you exactly what I mean in Desmos. Let's look at the super underfit model first. Let's look at the model. Let's let's make the window size, um, let's say 30 degrees, 30 degrees, uh, or let's do 35. Let's do 35, Nice, a nice big window for us to see. So this model is really underfit, right? 
we can see visually that is too flat. It is not fitting the data well, um, and it's not taking into account the specifics of every individual point enough. This is an underfit model, and we can mathematically see what it is by this bias variance decomposition. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna put the test point back on. Let's put the test point at 45 degrees. And let's look at the estimate that is being output for 45 degrees. So right now it is outputting a number. It thinks that it is right around uh, seven, right? So on the, on the y-axis here, it's right around seven meters. Let's see what happens if we change this, we change the whole data set. How does the estimate change? And let's look at what happens. So I'm gonna to go to the tab here called generate data. And I'm going to have Desmos animate through changing the random seed. And when it changes the random seed, the whole data set will change. Um, and we'll see what would happen if we got 30 new data points, right? So the, the whole thing is we started this whole project by shooting the cannon 30 times and we got some data. And now we're gonna see what would have happened in an alternate universe where we would have shot the cannon 30 times in a different way. What would happen to our estimate? That is the understanding the bias variance decomposition. So let's see what happens when we do that. So here we go, Desmos is animating. And while Desmos animates, I'm going to draw on the screen the different values we get. And I'm gonna draw one line for each one. Okay, this one has a bunch of lines here. Okay, so every time we run a different universe, we run a different 30 cannonball shots, which we do by changing the seed in Desmos, we get a different value for this estimate. And I drew a different horizontal line at those points so you could see what they are. And you can actually see that they are extremely tightly clustered between a minimum of six and a maximum of eight, approximately. So in all these alternate universes where we shot the cannonball 30 times and got 30 points of data, we always sort of get a value which is between six and eight. And this is representing the possible spreads of our estimator when the window size was 35 degrees. And there's two things I want you to notice about this collection of points between six and eight. Uh, one is, how much are they varying? What is the variance of this thing? And because it's between six and eight, the mean here is about seven, somewhere in between. And so you can calculate mathematically that the variance of this guy, um, let's do the variance, let's write it over here. Variance is approximately one meter squared. And that's because it's varying by about one from its mean. So the mean is around seven. And so the variance is how much is it spread out around that mean. And because it's between six and eight most of the time, a good estimate, a good approximation is one meter. You could really add it up and, and actually calculate the variance and get a real number. It's going to be about one meter. This is measuring the spread, spread, the spread over here. Okay, that's the variance. And this is quite low. This is low variance for this model, low variance. So the variance is low. The model is very consistently outputting numbers between six and eight. It's always approximately outputting the same thing. This is like when you throw a dart at a dartboard and you always land on the same spot every time you throw. Low variance, you're a good dart player. You are throwing it and consistently landing in a very small region. Good for you, low variance. On the other hand, the other thing I want you to notice is that the true value that we wanted is not six or eight. The true value, the true value was 10. That was the, where the actual blue curve is. So we are throwing the dart and it is always consistently landing in the same spot, but that spot is not the bullseye. We are missing the bullseye consistently. We are consistently quite a bit below and sort of typically we are around three meters below the true value. This is the other thing I want you to realize. This is called the bias the bias. The bias is what is the difference between what you do on average and the true value that you were trying to get. We were trying to get 10 and it looks like no matter how many times we simulate all these different universes of shooting 30 cannonballs, we're always getting values between six and eight. And so that means we're biased by about three. We're always a little bit below what we wanted. It's a good question here in the cannonball example. You can understand why, where is this bias coming from? We are averaging all of the cannonball shots between 10 degrees and 80 degrees, right? When, when our window size is 35 and we're trying to estimate what's going on at 45 degree cannons, we're estimating everything between 10 and 80 degrees. And that is a huge range. This huge range includes a lot of cannonball shots 
that are not very close to 45 degrees. So because we made our window so big, we're including things like when we shot the cannon at 15 degrees, when we shot the cannon at 20 degrees, and those points are quite a bit lower than shooting the cannon at 45 degrees. So it's no surprise that we're biased down, right? We're including cannonball shots that are not steep at 45 degrees, and therefore we're including cannonball shots that are quite a bit lower than what we're looking for. That is why we have bias, right? We, we have this pretty significant bias of three meters. This is also the reason, by the way, this 10 degrees to 80 degrees window being so big is also the reason we had low variance. 10 degrees to 80 degrees includes a lot of cannonball shots. It includes approximately, you know, 20 cannonball shots, uh, 15 to 20 cannonball shots, somewhere in there, typically, uh, of the 30. And because it's including such a large sample size, it, that's how it was achieving low variance. So this big region is both, you know, a curse because we have bias, we're including bad shots, and a blessing because we have low varies. And that is what's going on in this in this situation. So we have high bias and low variance. High bias and low variance, it's not changing much and it's consistently off by a little bit. High bias and low variance uh, means you are underfitting. You are underfitting. You're not, you're not uh, using the data as much as you could to lower that bias down. Let's see what happens on the extreme other end of the problem when we are overfitting. When we're overfitting, that was the situation we said, where the window is very, very small. Let's let's make the window super teeny tiny. Let's make it two degrees. I'm gonna make a two degree window. And we're gonna see what happens as we cycle through different possible universes where we shot the cannonball 30 times and see what happens. And once again, I'm going to just mark where uh, the different values are. So I'll starting here. Okay, there, there was one. There's one. There's one. There's another one. There's, a, okay, two are there. Here's one. Here's another one. Here's one. Okay, so now we have the sample. Here, I'll put that last one on there. Now we have a nice sample of all the different possible things that could have happened in many different universes of shooting the cannonball 30 times. And the spread here is really, really different than the spread we had in the large window size case. In the small window size case, we have a spread like this, and sometimes it's even above the true value. So the true value is still 10. Um, sometimes it's even above, and you can see it's a lot more spread out. This is more spread. This is high variance, high variance. High variance. Um, the spread here is really, really big. I, I would, I would estimate just eyeballing it that the variance here. Let's see. So the, the maximum was like 15. The minimum was something like three. So maybe this, the, the typical scale here we're talking about is like a distance of six. So the variance is like six meters squared. So a large variance. Uh, the spread here is really big. On the other hand, the bias is a lot better than it was before. On average, our points are somewhere, you know, there's a big clump over here, but there's some above pulling the pulling it up. There's a couple down there. I would say the average is somewhere around here. And so the bias is quite good. The bias here, I think, is approximately one meter down, maybe even less, is approximately one meter. So in this situation, even though there's a big spread, on average, going looking at all these different universes where we collected the data, on average, we're quite close to the true value of 10 meters, 10 meters. And we're, we're quite, we're pretty close to that. So in this situation, we have low bias, low bias, but high variance. Uh, and this is the quintessential hallmark of overfitting. So overfitting, you are fitting the data really well, which is giving you the low bias. You're going through the training points that you were given quite well, but the cost of that is that you are having a high variance. You're jumping around a lot to do this. And when you get a new data set, you'll do something completely different. That's high variance. Uh, in this situation, in the cannonball problem, you can see exactly why this is happening because of the small window size. So when the window size is very small, you're typically only averaging up one or two or three cannonball shots, right? So our 45 degree estimate is only going from 43 degrees to 47 degrees. And so there's just not many cannonball shots in this region. So the cannonball shots that are there are a very good estimate of the 45 degrees, right? They're gonna be really closely related 
to the 45 degree cannonball shot, but there's just not many of them. And when there's not many of them, we're subject to the whims of the wind on that day when we shot that particular cannonball shot. So because we're not averaging over many cannonball shots, that's why we have high variance. And because the cannonball shots we are using are very close to the 45 degrees that we wanted, that is why we have low bias. So this is why I like this example. You can really intuit why you have high variance and low bias. Okay, so I've shown you the underfit with the big window, the overfit with the tiny window, and I've talked about low and high variance. Let's recap it all on a nice graph to see why there must be a Goldilocks zone in between somewhere. And I'm going to make a big graph here where I'm going to graph window size, window size versus sources of error, of error. Okay, and the sources of error really has units of meters squared, right? Um, so it's either going to be variance, which has size meter squared, or the bias squared, uh, right? Because a bias below or a bias above are both bad for us. We want to square that and see what it is. So the window size is that we did. Um, we started with the large window, the large window. Let's do this over here. Large window. And we said the large window, it has low variance. So the variance is low, low variance. And that was because we had in a large window, you have many cannonball shots and you're averaging over all of them. And so, it, you know, when you average over like 20 different cannonball shots, the wind on any particular day doesn't matter as much. It's getting averaged out. That's why we have low variance. We also said we had high bias, high bias. Uh, and that was because when you average from 10 degrees to 80 degrees, you're going to include a lot of cannonballs that are not representative of shooting at 45 degrees. And that's really where our bias came from. We were quite a bit underestimating the real value of 10 because we were including such a big range. So we had high bias and low variance all due to this large window size uh, thing. On the other hand, for the small window, for the small window, things were the other way around. So we had high variance, high variance, and that's because our our cannonball, we were only looking at like one or two cannonball shots that were in the range, 42 degrees to 48 degrees. And there's just not many cannonballs that were shot at that angle. And so we only have like one or two cannonball shots. And so the wind on that particular day is really going to affect our results. We had high variance. We also had low bias, low bias. And that is because the cannonball shots we did average up were really representative of the 45 degrees. So this was the situation we had. On one side, there's high variance and low bias. On the other side, there's high bias and low variance. And you can draw a continuum of curves that go between these that have all the things in between. So bias is going to start low and it's going to go all the way up, up, up. So the bigger you make your window, the more you include points that are not representative of 45 degrees and you get this high bias term. Um, and you can mathematically calculate this. It turns out it depends on, in this particular example, it depends on the second derivative of the function. So where the function is very curvy, you're going to get more and more bias. And the bigger you make your window, the bigger bias you get. So this is the bias curve. And in fact, this is, I'm going to draw this as the bias squared. Bias squared. Okay. On the other hand, variance is doing the complete opposite thing. The bigger you make the window, the more points you include, the lower your variance is. Okay, so you get a curve like that. And it is a fact that the mean squared error can be decomposed as the sum of the bias squared and the variance. This is a fact, uh, fact, which is that the mean squared error can be written as the bias squared plus the variance. Oh, I went off the screen. Okay, plus the variance. Plus the variance. Okay, and we'll uh, do that. So, okay, ignore, <laughs> ignore this stuff over here. Okay. So the mean squared error is the sum of that blue curve, the bias squared, and the variance. So what is it going to look like? Well, the sum is going to be this U-shaped curve that looks something like this, right? So as the bias increases over here, you're bias dominated. You get a lot of uh, error from the bias. And over here, you get a lot of error from the variance. And there's a sweet spot in between where the sum of these two things is minimized. This sweet spot is what I called the Goldilocks zone. It might not be exactly where they cross. This is the Goldilocks spot. Goldilocks spot. Okay, so this is why you have a spectrum between underfitting and overfitting and why there is something in between. So underfitting is this large window. This is under underfitting. And you have low variance, but high bias. Overfitting is the opposite. 
where you have low bias and high variance, and the Goldilocks spot is in between where the mean squared error, which is the bias squared plus the variance, is minimized. So you want to minimize the sum of these two things, and there's a sweet spot in between where neither is so big that there neither is contributing that much, and you get this Goldilocks spot in between. The nice thing is, for this cannonball problem, it is simple enough. You can actually calculate these actual curves, and you can actually calculate the theoretical minimum. So you can like draw a graph of this blue curve, you can draw a graph of this red curve, um, and you can see how they depend on the window size, and then you can do like first year calculus and find the minimum. And that is what I did. So let me uh, go back to this guy. Let's stop the randomization. And I have a little tab here where I put in the calculation of what I think the theoretical optimal window is. And it came out to 11.5 in this situation. It also depends on the number of points and how much noise there is and stuff like that. But in this case, it came to 11.5. And you can see over here, we're clearly overfitting, right? This is a small window, we're overfitting. We have high error of 3.6. On the other side of the extreme over here, we have high error again. The root mean squared error is 3.2. And if we set it to the optimal where this little X is, it should be much lower. And it's not perfect because there's random noise and stuff, but that is right around where the minimum happens. And the error here is only 1.5. And that is the bottom of that U-shaped bowl. On one side, you're overfitting. On the other side, you're underfitting. And this is the Goldilocks spot where our function is just right. Um, okay, let's just for fun, let's listen to the function one more time. Hopefully you at least learned about the play graph sounds in, uh, in Desmos. Okay, so now you know about overfitting, underfitting, and the Goldilocks function.